Church, please join me in a word of prayer. Almighty God, gracious Father, we humbly give you thanks for continuing to sustain us by the space where we can come to gather around your word, to receive your sacrament, to come to know who you are more intimately and more deeply. Father, thank you for giving us not only spiritual signs of your presence, but physical, tangible signs of who you are. Father, help us to cling to these in times of trouble. And so, Father, I ask that in this time, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've talked quite a bit about my experience and my time in the Navy Reserves. And so I've shared with a lot of you that my job in the Navy was called a religious program specialist. And so part of my training included having to go to a base in North Carolina and learn about all the different world religions that were represented in the Navy. This is to better equip me to serve any kind of chaplain that I may be put under uh, during my time in the Navy. Uh, So during this time, I've, I've shared that I really got to understand my faith much better throughout this experience. I learned that I had a deep fascination not only with my own faith, uh, but with the concept of religion in general. It fascinated me to learn more about what other people believe and their reasons why, and some of the more extreme cases were all the more interesting uh, to me. So one day I was scrolling through Netflix a couple years ago, and I came across this documentary about a short-lived cult that was out in Oregon during the 80s. Um, Now, those of you who've lived a little bit longer than I have uh, might remember seeing them on the news as the orange people, Uh, These are people that wore all orange suits as a sign of their uh, devotion to their their spiritual leader. Uh, So they followed the leadership of this man that they called the Bhagwan. This was an Indian guru. And so he created this cult out in Oregon. And so he called his followers to abandon what he called the confines of traditional living. So he told people to abandon marriage, abandon having kids, abandon having an eight to five job. These are all things that are hindering freedom and personal expression. And so we need to abandon the confines of modernity and go out into this uh, camp or wherever he is and and celebrate our faith there. So I wouldn't exactly recommend this documentary for casual viewing. It is a little bit more explicit. But there's one scene that I wanted to talk about that I found especially heartbreaking. To make a long story short, the cult begins to split because the leaders were found out to be complete frauds. They were all leading people astray just to make money and take advantage of them. Some of the cult members were interviewed after this came to light. And in the wake of this discovery, some of the ex-cult members' responses were as follows. I feel so much pain inside. These were people I so trusted. They turned out to be the total opposite of who I thought they were. What happened to these people that could have gone so wrong? despite their obviously flawed beliefs and practices. One can't help but feel a sense of pity for these people who have abandoned decent lives for the sake of a fruitless dream. Many of these cult members worked hard to build a self-sufficient community. They believed passionately what they were being taught. And now they learned it was all for nothing. Think of the immense sadness And betrayal these people must have felt when they found out the one person they had been following was a fraud. I imagine this is similar to how the disciples must have felt in the aftermath of Jesus Christ's death. This supposed Messiah they had been following for three years was just murdered before them in the most brutal brutal, and inhumane way possible. It's no wonder so few of them actually followed Jesus to the place of his crucifixion. The vast majority of them abandoned him, and they even denied his name. It's for this reason they were hiding in the first place. The disciples left their rabbi in the hands of those who were trying to kill him, fearing instead for their own personal lives. Jesus once called them to take up their cross and follow him, but instead they forsook the cross and abandoned him. In losing complete hope in the one who was promised to be the light of the world, they have locked themselves away in the darkness of their own home. We often assume the disciples would be happy to see Jesus after his resurrection. 
But consider this just for a moment. They betrayed Jesus. They denied his name. And they turned their back on him as he died. Do we really think that when he came back, they would be happy to see him? If they had an ounce of common sense, they would be terrified at his presence. Jesus was right the entire time, which is evident from his resurrection. Not only did they doubt him, but they betrayed the Son of God. So when Jesus passes into their midst and is among them, you can imagine the anxious silence that overtook the room. What is Jesus going to do next? Is he going to sternly rebuke them? Is he going to send a lightning down to crash down upon them? They deserve as much. But what does he do instead? Not a stern rebuke. Not even a raised voice. But our Lord says, peace be with you. This is no fruitless dream, church. And the life the disciples have been called to was not a failure. Earlier in his ministry, Christ promised them his peace by saying, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This peace is fulfilled in Christ's resurrection from the dead. There's no despair or sorrow left in death. For what God has promised us through Jesus Christ has arrived. The peace of the Lord flows from the empty tomb, and it offers rest to those who have locked themselves away in darkness. But this great news has not reached everyone yet. The Apostle Thomas wasn't present when Jesus makes his first appearance. Now, we've all heard sermons about doubting Thomas. The poor disciple who earned the unfortunate reputation of doubting Christ's resurrection from the dead. Don't be like Thomas, we've been told. Have stronger faith than Thomas did. But how quick we are to forget that Thomas was the first disciple who was willing to die for the sake of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 11, Jesus must risk his life to go see his friend Lazarus. And Thomas responds, let us go also so that we may die with you. If you observe this story closely, Thomas does not live up to the doubting reputation that he's earned. Had Peter or James or John also not been present in the room at this time, then we can safely assume that they would also express the same doubt that Thomas did. The disciples were not overjoyed, and they didn't rejoice until they had seen the wounds of Christ. Thomas is not the doubting exception that he's often portrayed as, but instead he vocalizes the same doubt that all the disciples once had. This story is often used to make an enemy of doubt or skepticism. But church, do we hear Jesus rebuking Thomas for his inquiry? Does Jesus say, how dare you question me? You just have to believe what I tell you? No. But because Thomas wasn't there to hear it the first time, Jesus says it again. Peace be with you. Come, Thomas, feel the wounds on my hands. Thomas, come, feel the wound on my side. Touch, see, feel, and believe the gospel. There's a pervasive myth that our faith must be purely spiritual. Our relationship to God is often defined in terms of our inner being, our feelings, our heart. These are all non-material things, and while they're important, anything that involves material or outward expression, well, we can't do that because that's too Catholic. That's idolatry. We can't have that in our worship. But church, Jesus reminds us this morning that we are called to a life in him that engages all of our senses. We confess that Jesus is truly and actually in our midst when we celebrate word and sacrament as a community. This is not in a vague spiritual sense where he's really up in heaven. 
but he is present. We truly hear his voice in the words of Holy Scripture. We truly receive his body and blood from the altar. And we truly see his face in all of those who will soon wish us the peace of the Lord. Thomas is not an example of who not to be, but rather Thomas is a model for how one grows in discipleship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ does not rebuke questions or inquiry, but he invites questions because Jesus is the truth in himself. But in our sin, it's natural for us to have inner conflict and questions. For the Apostle Paul tells us the wisdom of the Spirit is in constant conflict with the wisdom of the age. When confronted with the truth of the gospel, the doubt of those whom he calls turns to abounding faith, in which we also proclaim like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Christ doesn't leave us without evidence of his resurrection. He doesn't demand that we blindly follow him with no proof of who he is or what he's done. But instead, he invites us to investigate the gospel for ourselves and read the words of eternal life so that we may find peace that he alone offers each of us. It's not exactly news that there are many people today who are in despair, locked away in their own dark rooms. There are many who have been disappointed by people and ideas they once strongly believed in in the past few years. But we give thanks that Christ surpasses the locks that we fasten outside our own doors. Not to condemn, not to rebuke, but to come into our midst and bring us his everlasting peace. May the peace of the Lord be brought to all those who come seeking that peace, which only he can give. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.